Hello, we will be working on uh, problem 8.48 today, which is variable and fixed overhead. There are a couple of hooks, like you know, everything else has a, everything else that we do has a few hooks in there because systems, you know, are not perfect. And usually, if they have a hook that troubles you, it usually is part of the system that is uh, not consistent with the other part of the system because you know we're pretty good at things that are consistent, but uh, an account, accounting systems are always full of inconsistencies because what we're trying to do is, you know, more or less impossible. And so we, we, we have cut a few corners historically to make things work. And they do work, but when you're learning about them, you encounter all of these small issues where things are not completely consistent across the entire system. So uh, we have 8.52. If you take a look at uh, the data that we have, notice it's maybe a tad you know, more complicated than uh, than the last one, 8.48. Did I just say that wrong? Oh, I'm totally giving you the wrong problem numbers. Uh, we're actually going to be looking at uh, 8.48. The last problem we worked out was 8.42. So 8.48 is just maybe just a little bit more complicated. Um, not a lot more numbers, but you know, the difficulty level is coming up just a little bit here because what they're doing is they're not giving you the standard cost card. They're giving you some other derived information. What you have to do is you have to know the standard cost card well enough that you can actually back compute a few numbers. Okay, so this is, you know, this is quite a bit trickier than the last pro problem we worked on. Uh, you'll look, when I say tricky, obviously the numbers are, not, are easy. It's knowing how to use the numbers that, that are there is quite a bit trickier. So uh, if you don't have uh, the paper copy of the book, you know, press pause, jot this down before we continue. You need to have this in front of you. And it should be, try and lay it out more or less the way you see it there on the screen or uh, look at it on another device because you need to refer back and forth to this while you're, while you're following uh, what I do. So here we go. Uh, problem 8.48, I'm going to start as I start everything in accounting by trying to get down on my paper or my board what I know. You know, try and get the facts that you know clear because you know, accounting, accounting is complicated and the more stuff floating around your head, the more confusing it's going to be. So we are going to be working on a uh, variable overhead first and then after we finish that we'll work on the fixed overhead. We're going to use the same structure, AQ times AP, AQ times SP, SQ times SP. Same overall logic on your paper. Continue it down. I'll, I'll, I'll do, I will do the variable overhead here and then flip this around to do the fixed overhead. You should continue uh, down the, the column if you can. Uh, and here we go. First thing to do is look around and you'll encounter the first hook. Uh, this is a hook for everybody. When you try and put up the AQ here, like what is AQ? Right? So that's going to be something you have to come to grips with in just a minute. First step is always look around because really, really actually you don't really care if you have any of that stuff. What you want is the answer. You want to get the total here, the total here, the total here. First, look and see if they're giving it to you. That, you know, it'll save you some time later. So press pause, hunt around for just one minute and see if they're giving you any of those totals. Okay, I hope you made a shot at this. If you look around, they actually did tell you actual over actual, the keyword for the actual column, actual overhead uh, incurred, variable overhead 252. I'm looking at it. As soon as I turn away, I forget what it is. $250,000. Okay? So it turns out you don't actually have to get either of these here, uh, but you will have to get them over here because if you look around, are they actually giving you the flexible budget amount? No. So now you have to come up with that. And there you're stuck with this problem. The AQ has to be the same. What's the AQ? What's an AQ, you know, like what's the actual quantity for overhead? That's actually a big puzzler. You can look at the answer and get it and just sort of coast through and say, okay, I know I got the answer, I'm going. 
but you can get hooked later, like in a multiple choice or a big problem or another big problem, because you need to come to grips with this concept of really what is an AQ for overhead? You know, you're going to have to think about that. The AQ for overhead in a technical, I'm giving you the technical answer, but you have to run it through your brain so that you, so you know it more than just the technical answer. It's the denominator of the POR. So predetermined over rate, oh, over rate, predetermined overhead rate, you know, dollars per something. So I'll scratch that down here. So you're going to have dollars per something in the denominator. In our textbook culture, the most common one is direct labor hours, but it can be machine hours, machine dollars, direct labor dollars, it can be other stuff too, you know. Um, but the denominator here has to be what the AQ is. Okay. That's, this is a tough, this is a mental hurdle because it's not the AQ for direct material and for uh, the uh, direct labor. You can often have a different AQ for that. So this, though, you have to say, we are providing overhead based on volume of whatever that denominator is. In this case, you look around, stop, the bit, stop this recording for a second and look around and see if you can decide what, we are, what is the denominator for the POR in this problem. Okay? So the, the, the denominator is direct labor hours. Okay, so if you looked around at the data you were given, they don't tell you exactly, but if you look around, you'll come up with direct labor, uh, direct labor hours. Mistake you're going to make is dollars per unit. That is a mistake, but it's a, it's a very common beginner mistake. As you work this out or follow me, we'll, help, we'll try and untangle that. So the AQ here is going to be DLH. And one reason you know that because it's going to be some number of direct labor hours times some standard price. Our standard prices are always standard prices of the input units. This has to be the standard price from the standard cost card. Standard cost cards are based on input units, not on output units. So it can't be dollars per unit. It can't be. It has to be dollars per some, one of the input factors such as direct labor hours, okay? So when you come up to this and you work in units, dollars per DLH, okay, you're going to start, it'll affect your thinking so that you will avoid the mistake of using the numbers they gave you, which they give you the numbers as six, where is it? Six dollars per unit and eight dollars per unit, okay? Six dollars per unit for the variable overhead. A lot of you, if you started working this problem without watching this video, you would try and embed that number there on that screen and it would, you would get tangled up in a mess that you would be difficult to untangle. So what we need to know, do now though is know what the actual quantity of direct labor hours is. If you look in here, they're going to tell you. See if you can uh, figure it out. So stop the video, come back. Okay, in this case, they tell you exactly what it is. You don't have to figure it out. That's not gonna be the case in all problems. Actual DLH worked 80,000. So we're going to have 80,000 DLH. That would be the same here. And if you figure this out, this would be $3.13 per DLH. You don't need that number in this case, but, you know, as a beginner, sometimes it's good to fill in all the boxes just so that you are rehearsing the entire system. Over here, then, this is where one of the hooks comes in. What is the variable overhead charge rate? What is the POR? And trust me, it's not $6 per unit. Okay? We, don't, that, we don't really do that. Um, well, we rarely do that. How can you figure out what the charge rate is per direct labor hour? Well, this is where you're going to have to step back. Notice I just stepped back. Why did I do that? Step back, I meant mentally step back, but then I step back. You have to look back and say, okay, how do we create the budget? Remember the center column? This is the flexible budget column. You've studied flexible budgeting before in your management accounting class. And you knew part of it, but you know, pieces are still floating around and, and you don't remember a lot of it. But you have to come back and exercise that muscle in order to know what, uh, what the SP is here. 
If they tell you the variable overhead charge rate was $6 per unit, you need to figure out how many direct labor hours it takes to make a unit. If you read the text, well, first you have to realize that you have to look for that. So when you work this problem, one of the aha moments or, or big learning things you break through is when you see the $6 per unit, you have to say, ah, I have to find dollars per direct labor hour. So you read around and up in the text it says, based on a normal uh, monthly volume of 50,000 units, which uses 100,000 direct labor hours. They're actually telling you it's two DLH per unit produced. So that charge rate of $6 per unit is really $3 per DLH, which also then has to be the same here. And then this has to be DLH. Why? Because the end, has, the end answer has to be dollars. The end answer has to be dollars. If you have DLH here and you have to make it turn into dollars, then the only units it can be is dollars per DLH. Okay? Same thing here. If you have dollars per DLH and you know this has to be 3 and this because these SPs always have to be the same, these AQs always have to be the same, then that means that this has to be direct labor hours too. And this would be the number of direct labor hours you should have worked. This is that SQA idea. How many direct labor hours should you have worked to make the number of units you actually made? So you know that you should have used two DLH per unit. So look in here and say, how many units did you actually make? Okay. Notice it says 38,000. So if you made 38,000 units, you should have used two DLH for each of those units or 76,000 DLH. which would be 38,000 units times um, 2 DLH per unit. Invert and multiply, the units cancel, and that leaves you with the DLH. 2 times 38,000 is your DLH. So we now have the pieces that we need, the 3 times 76, the 3 times 80. So uh, 240,000 dollars for that one, 228,000. And we will then have the variances that we need to compute. First of all, I'm going to identify fixed, fixed, uh, favorable or unfavorable. 228 minus 240 is a negative number, that's going to be a U. 240 minus 250, another negative number, that's going to be a U. This is 10,000. This is 12,000. So I have these two variances. Now I need to do the journal entry. Let me give you a verbal description, and then I want you to stop the video for a second. See if you can mock up with a pencil. Why do accountants always use pencils? Because accounting is so complicated, nobody can ever do this right the first time. Nobody, even me. Okay? So pencils is the way to go. Um, standard costing system means that all of the debits to main accounts in the system, meaning every time something is transferred into a resource or into WIP or into FGI, that transfer in, and remember all those transfers in, think about them, those are all debit entries. They have to be at the standard cost. Okay? So press, press pause. See if you can mock up the entry, and it's one journal entry with four lines in it for variable overhead based on this. Just take a minute, right? All the numbers are computed, so that should, you know, so you can actually mock up the journal entry quickly. Okay, you're back. This is the standard cost. This has to be the name main debit. This is where it came from, which is the variable overhead account. Okay. The account titles are WIP, Department A, Variable Overhead. Down here, the debit credit account is from Variable Overhead. Now we have these two. They're both unfavorable, so we know that they're both debits. You may not know that now. Think it through so that you know that as soon as you see it. Unfavorable means that that what happened was worse than what we thought. 
So we, and remember, these are all expenses eventually. The reason we paid this money was to run this through the system so that it all goes out cost of goods sold. So what this is telling us is, oh, cost of goods sold is going to be 12,000 more than we thought, right? How do, you make a, how do you make an expense go up? With debit entry. Oh, cost of goods sold is going to be an additional $10,000 more than we thought. How do you make a cost of goods sold go up? Debit entry. So these are go both going to be debit entries, 10,000 and 12,000. The account titles, WIP, Department A, and then the name of the variance, and then WIP, Department A, and then the name of the variance. In this case, this variance, the 10,000, is a spending variance or a purchase variance. Name's not too important, but you have to have the idea of buying. So spending variance, so often abbreviated SV for spending variance. So you can abbreviate it SV, I'll take that. If you, use, if you do anything else, you have to sort of spell out what your idea was, purchasing variance, buying variance among us. And this is usually called E. V efficiency variance, although the name for the EV is a little bit less stable. You see more variation in that name. So there we go. We have all the pieces. We have the journal entries. Notice the journal entry. There is no actual here in an account, but if you want to know the actual, you take these and you add those to it, so you can always reconstruct what the actual was. And the main balance in the, de in the Department A, WIP Department A, variable overhead account, main balance is $228,000. Okay? And that will be what actually exits in the next system. So now we're going to turn this around and work on the fixed overhead. Notice there are a couple of hooks we already mentioned. One is knowing that for overhead, the Q, the AQ, all the Qs are actually the denominator of what your, whatever your POR was. And so sometimes you have to back into it. And in this problem, you do, because in this problem, they did not give you the standard cost card. They gave you a number computed from the standard cost card, and you have to back into what the standard cost card said. So fixed overhead. This one is going to be, for most people, harder than the variable overhead. The reason it's going to be harder is that this, well, actually, the main, well, this is the cell that you will have the most difficulty with. But the main reason is actually all accounting systems have little pieces that are done in different ways. And so that, this is where you're going to encounter it really forcefully. So we have the AQ, the AP, same thing here. But we also, as first step, let's look around and see if they're just giving us any totals. Okay? So pause. Pause the recording, look around, see if you can find a total for a fixed overhead. And you can, $384,000. I sort of like that little squeak. <laughs> Makes me think I'm doing something. Now we need to come up with the center column, and this is where, this is the giant stumbling block. For you guys because you don't actually understand flexible budgeting. You studied it in your management accounting class. If you got here, you probably passed those questions and in fact you don't understand it completely. So this is going to be a rough spot because it depends on really knowing flexible budgeting logic pretty well to reliably get this. Now after you work this problem and a few others, it'll increase your understanding of flexible budgeting for a specific reason. But at this point, when you first see this, you, this is not going to make sense. The computation is dead easy, but you're not computing forward. Okay? I have to stop and say to you, flexible budgeting, we have variable costs and fixed costs. Which ones do we flex? If you don't know the answer to that, then you don't really understand flexible budgeting. And I'm sure that none of you know right now, right? You're going to have to stop, think back. It was a long time ago. You've done a lot of stuff since then. And you're going to have to hunt around for the answer. The answer is what, which costs flex or do they all flex? Okay? So you can stop and 
Stop and think of this for a minute. It will help your learning if you stop and give yourself 30 seconds to answer that question. Variable costs and fixed costs in flexible budgeting, which ones flex? Okay, you come back. It's the variable costs that flex. Fixed costs don't flex in, in flexible budgeting. And remember, one reason I keep using this table version other than the formulas is it helps using the table version but with me in class helps you understand flexible budgeting and stand, you know in the standard cost column type of income statement a little bit better. It's, you know, it, you can see this and understand it and you'll be fine with the formulas. Even if you like the formula approach better, watching and thinking about this using the table approach will help you understand the formulas better. So what we have is this column, the AQ is not flexing. This is not this AQ here for FOH does not have the same definition as the AQ for any variable cost. And what do we have on the other side of that board? Variable overhead. So what you have to do here is say, okay, flex, fixed costs don't flex. So the, the, the number that needs to be in there has to be my original estimate of what fixed cost was when I, when I originally created the standard cost card, which is the original static budget. What, what is it? So what was, the, what was the cue that I used when I originally made this budget together? And what was the POR rate that I used? And if you look around here, you can just pop those numbers. The numbers are actually on the page. Why not? They're not. You can compute the numbers based, easily based on what's on the page. So stop this video, give yourself one minute, and see if you can come up with what the AQ and the, and the SP are. Okay. The AQ is 100,000. And the SP is $4 per DLH. This is from the original budget. Notice they have to give it to you in the text. In order to answer a problem like this, you have to know what the original computation was. They have to give it to you somewhere, which would be the original normal volume of units and, and uh, direct labor hours. So this is, in effect, given to you, but you have to know that it's there and put it up there. This is a giant stumbling block because in your brain, you don't differentiate yet between fixed and variable costs in the same way. right? You, what you guys want to do right here is this, right? If you, if you did not listen to me at first, I'm sure 90%, maybe 100% of you working on this problem without me would try and put the 80,000 in there, okay? The 80,000 here is correct because this is the AQ for a variable item. So it, it's the flexed AQ. When we're work doing the AQ for a non-flex thing, meaning something flexing means adjusting, if it's something that we don't adjust for volume, then we use the original volume from the beginning of the period and the original POR. So $400,000. Now we come to the SQA, which is a flexed item because the SQA is how much quantity should we have used to make the number of units we made? We made, made 38,000 units. How many direct labor hours should we have used? It turns out that this SQA is the same as the SQA for the variable cost, that same 76,000 times, though, the four. Whoops, that's an arrow. $4 per direct labor hour, or $304,000. We need the variances. 304 minus 4, whoa, that's a big U. That's a big difference, a big negative number. 400384 oh, that's F, that's favorable. That's $96,000. This is $16,000 favorable. Okay, so... This one is giant, and it's pretty normal. This is this one. This one variance is the one that is the most up and down crazed number because it's the one that's the least, actually, almost no impact of what happens in the factory hits this number. 
This number is different because the original forecast was different, and that's it. The only reason this number is different is because what we actually did is different from what our static forecast at the beginning of the year was. So this is called the volume variance, and there's never it's there's no interpretation of it. So many of the other variances, people try and interpret it about efficiency, and we were doing the good thing. Did we make the right decision? Did we buy at the right price? Did we were we efficient with our labor? A lot of people spend time doing that. It's pretty much a waste of time, but still in the traditional world, they try and do that, except this one. Even in the traditional world, this variance never had a, 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 an interpretation, an economic interpretation, other than uh, our budget forecast was off. Okay? So now we need to do the journal entries again. I want you to do the same thing if you can. You saw the model for the variable overhead. I want you to pause the video, look at what we did for variable overhead, and you write out your version of this journal entry for fixed overhead. Okay, what you should have done is, now remember, what I'd like you to do is think back to the logic here. Standard costing. All the debits into main accounts are at standard cost. This is the standard cost. So this has to be the main debit. It has to come out of that other account here, 384. It's going into WIP. Department A, and this is FOH, sometimes called FOH Applied. Right? It's coming out of the FOH account. We're going to have a debit and a credit. Remember, run your logic again. Don't just look at this mechanically if you can't. You can do this mechanically, but also stop and say, why, why is a U always a debit? It's its relationship to the ultimate expense of cost of goods sold. So we know that's going to be a debit, or at least I know it's going to be a debit. You will soon, probably not quite yet. And you could remember mechanically, you could just, there's obviously only one way these plug in, but stop yourself and try and run the logic too. It'll help you later. So, work in process, Department A, volume variance. I'll just abbreviate with a VV. And over here, WIP, Department A, usually called budget variance. Name's a little, that name is a little bit unstable. You could call it, as long as you call it something clear. You have to have the WIP Department A, WIP Department A. And of course, in a real company, there are no account names. They're all numbers. So we are trying to make, we're trying to use text descriptions in our journal entries to make sure you understand the logic. In a real place, it would all be account numbers, and there would be no names, obviously. And you know that, you know, those of you on the work term uh, for a medium or bigger company would have seen that. Uh, you know, if, you're, if your clients are in the little tiny clients, they probably still have account names. So we look at this. This is then the journal entry sequence. And uh, welcome aboard to standard costing. So this is the most complex normally encountered system. If, like, as I mentioned before, if you're unfortunate enough to work with uh, fund accounting, which they actually use at Brock, crazily enough, uh, your job, if you're in a fund accounting system, is to get rid of it. It provides no benefit at all. In some, in some cases, in some jurisdictions, it's mandated because of old-fashioned ideas of control and accountability, which turns out to be wrong. If you have a good accounting system, like a standard cost system, plus a good budget, you actually get more control and accountability than you can get with fund accounting. Because then what you do is you show to the regulators or to the board of directors, you, they just have the right to see the budget and the accounting system, they get more. Anyway, so other than uh, uh, fund accounting, this is now the most account complex accounting system. You're just seeing the introductory version of it, and you're seeing it in a pretty comprehensive way. It's a lot easier to understand when you see these columns and you can understand it. When you use it, of course, in a real situation, you would never see that. You would just see little, little tiny fragments. Um, as a learner, though, it's really good to see the big picture. That way that when you see a fragment later, 
it'll actually make sense because you'll know where the fragment fits in some other place. So that then is uh, the last bit of, or the last introduction to the journal entry sequence and standard costing. I am uh, going to make another video probably on uh, problem 8.51, 8 which is a, uh, has an important set of variances that are in addition to this. So there is another set of variances you can compute off of the uh, variable cost variances called mix and yield variances, which is another variance system that's on top of what we already did. Um, but don't do that. Don't look at that video or do that problem until you have done these problems and the other related problems a couple of times. You need to master this level before you can move to the next level. So. Welcome aboard. Uh, good to have you here with us in standard cost land, and we will uh, continue. Slight more complexity, and then we'll move on to Chapter 9 and dig into overhead analysis a little bit more. Bye-bye.